My parents joined a religious organization in the early 90s. They've given their time, money, and ultimately their children to this organization. In summer of 2002, my mother received a phone call from one of the executive representatives of the group. The lady was calling to inform my parents that it was the will of God that my brother and I began our pilgrimage into manhood. And part of that meant moving to the headquarters of the organization located in Kansas City, Kansas. So the following evening, our bags were packed, and we were off to begin this new life. When we got there, we were taken to meet the strangers who would transport us. After giving our parents our hugs and saying our goodbyes, we discovered that our arranged transportation was on the back of a 18-wheeler semi-truck. We rode nearly 600 miles on the back of a truck as if we were packages being sent out for delivery. When we arrived to Kansas, we were taken to the place we would stay, a small apartment. There were dozens of boys and men packed like sardines. We were immediately put to work, dictated on how to dress, how to speak, how to walk, what to eat. And to disobey meant severe punishment, slashes with a rod or paddle, days, sometimes weeks of fasting, or worse, beaten till bones were broken, face swollen, anything that would remind the other kids what happens when you disobey. I started out as a dishwasher in back of the restaurant owned by the traffickers. I would work countless hours a day, restlessly reporting in at 8 a.m. and not leaving sometimes till 3 a.m. the next morning. One time, I showed up late for work, a habit I soon regret making, because almost immediately upon walking through the doorway of the small diner, I found myself on the floor bleeding after being hit in the mouth with a yellow page phone book. Attempting to stand to my feet, the man began to beat me on the back until I passed out. Acts of violence were not of rare occasion at all. A good friend of mine named Najee found himself being questioned by four men about something he should not have done. Almost immediately, without notice, one of the men threw a punch that brought Najee to the floor. The other three men eagerly followed up with blows of their own. They concluded their beatdown section by kicking him down a flight of about 13 stairs. To add insult to injury, one of the guys literally poured salt on Najee's wounds. I was just 12 years old, shocked, saddened, and terrified of the possibility of facing the same consequences as my older friend. Till this day, I'm still unsure of what Najee did wrong. But one thing was made clear to me, my well-being was no longer in my parents' hands. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Elijah, why didn't you just pick up the phone and call your parents and tell them what was going on? If the traffickers allowed me to use the phone, the call was monitored 
by the executives to be sure that not too much detail was given as pertains to what was going on. And so the next nine years that followed, without my parents' permission, I was taken to New Jersey, Georgia, Maryland, and places all around the country that the trafficking organization owned property. It began to seem like every year I was being taken to one place to the next. And everywhere I went, the living arrangements were the same as what I experienced in Kansas. Finally, the last place I worked before escaping the group was Harlem, New York. While working in a trafficker's New York restaurant, I had received word that a friend of mine had died. Message of her death began to spread like wildfire. Feeling bombarded by all the questions surrounding the young teen's death, the founder of the organization made announcement of it. In a nutshell, he said that the young girl wanted to die and she killed herself by becoming ill. It seemed that most people accepted that explanation, but not me. I knew better. How do you go from being well to two months later being ashes in an urn? Not soon after, I learned the truth. My friend pleaded that she did not feel well. She begged to be taken to the hospital. They forced her to work through her illness until eventually her immune system shut down. We were not allowed to seek professional medical help. That meant no annual physicals, no dentists, and no treatment for illness. In her case, she was allowed to go to the ER, but by the time they began treatment, it was too late. Parents all around the country joined this forced labor human trafficking ring disguised as a religious organization, willingly sending their children off, placing them in an unfortunate situation. My childhood was ripped from me. When I finally got out, it was a culture shock to say the least. People would ask me about my upbringing and my life and I would tell them things that sound good to avoid talking about what I went through. But it wasn't until I embraced my truth that I actually started to heal. And you know what? I learned I am not that unique. We all have things that we've been through that has caused us to dare ourselves to be ourselves. Fortunately, I have overcome most obstacles that have stood in my way. Good therapy, developing friendships, education, and work related to survivors like myself makes me thrive. By far, my greatest assets are my family and friends. When I fall to moments of sadness, nightmares, anxiety, and confusion, it is them 
who lift me up. And although moments and years of my life stolen could have wrecked me, I have gotten up stronger than ever. <laughs> 